All right, thanks for tuning in. In this video, we'll take a look at some of the concepts related to our study of energy and air pollution. So we can see that most of the electricity in our country comes from coal, and natural gas is second. These different energy sources have different amounts of net energy yield. The idea here is you have to put energy in to be able to get energy out. And um, we think of solar cells as having low to medium net energy yield because it does take energy to manufacture the cells. You have to take sand, you have to heat the sand, and from that you can make your silicon. But other things like wind has a very high net energy yield. You don't need as much energy going in to make your wind turbine. So where do fossil fuels fall on the spectrum? Natural gas you can see is medium, coal is high. We have to do a lot of mining with the coal, and then we have to do processing of that coal. So I want to talk about crude oil for a moment, because crude oil looks a lot like this. How do we turn what you see on the left here, this black goo, into clear and um, very fluid gasoline? Well, the main thing is that we distill it. So you take it, it's in this crude oil, you heat it. And in heating it, you start to evaporate the components. These different components will end up uh, condensing at different temperatures. The higher you go in this column, the cooler it is. So butane can remain um, evaporated until 5 degrees Celsius. So that would be the last thing that you would collect off the top. And um, you can see gasoline is here and diesel is here. Lubricating oil, heavy gas oil. These are things that are like thick greases. Okay, so with that, with that idea, nuclear energy is thought to have a very low net energy yield because you have to do a lot of mining of the, of the uranium. You have to purify the uranium. And, um, and from that point, you can use it as a fuel source. Um, I want to talk about what do we do with the waste that's left over after the nuclear reaction. And as you can see here, it is stored first in a cooling pond where it undergoes continual um, radiation decay into non-radioactive or into less radioactive elements. Um, but ultimately what you're left with is radioactive waste that needs to be stored for thousands of years. It, it decomposes very slowly. This is usually stored on site. Here we see uh, our closest nuclear waste depository is at Diablo Canyon Nuclear Power Plant in San Luis Obispo. So with Half-Life, we can see that however much you're starting with of a radioactive material, um, in whatever its Half-Life period is, that means that after that time, half of it will have become non-radioactive. So for plutonium, for example, which has a Half-Life of around 1,000 years, if you started with 100 kilograms of it, after 100 years, you would have 50 kilograms of radioactive plutonium. The rest of it would have um, gone through radioactive decay into some other element. After 100 more years, you would have half of half, which in this case would be 25 kilograms still being radioactive. And I'll point out here that nuclear fusion is the opposite of the nuclear fission that's occurring in nuclear power plants. With fusion, you're actually taking two light elements, in this case hydrogen, and you're fusing them together to make helium. You get a lot of energy from this. This is the foundation for the H-bomb, as we call it, and um, in other words, nuclear weapons. The nice thing about this is that all the products, byproducts, are non-radioactive, so there is no radioactive waste to deal with. Pro some problems with this waste, though, is that, number one, if it spills, it can get into the groundwater, and or soil for that matter. But also, um, it, if it's not under good security, it can potentially be stolen by terrorists and used to make what we call dirty bombs. From, that, um, from the radioactivity of this material, they can make radioactive bombs. Okay, um, so I had you watch already about Fukushima and Chernobyl. Why is nuclear energy awesome? Okay, let's jump to this. So, on the left side here, we have a coal-fired electric power plant, and in the top right, we have a nuclear power plant. 
What are some things that you see that are similar between the two? You might notice that they both have these cooling towers, and that's just to cool the water that's being used to turn the steam back into water. But what the coal plant has are these smokestacks. So we can see here smoke coming out, and that smoke has associated with it carbon dioxide that you get from burning anything, sulfur oxides, and particulate matter. The nice thing about nuclear is what's coming out is only water. So, um, how do we deal with those particulate matters? Um, we can use what's called electrostatic precipitators. And you'll see here, there's a positive and a negative. And as the gas goes through, the particles get attracted to the negative plate and um, from there, they can, you can sort of like shape, shake the whole mechanism and get this ash to fall into a silo or a storage container. And from there, you can collect it and haul it away to a landfill. So this is really important because smog can have a lot of particulates. Um, and you can see some stats here about a big event that occurred in London. We had a similar event in Pennsylvania in 1948. Believe it or not, this is at midday. So there's a distinction between PM10 and PM2.5. 10 refers to the size, 10 microns or micrometer, so 10 millionths of a meter, and versus 2.5. So you can see here that a human hair is about 50 to 70 microns in diameter. Fine beach sand is approximately that size. Dust tends to be around PM10, so dust, pollen, and mold. Um, and those can often be captured by the hairs of your, um, of your nose, for example, with dust or mucus. But PM2.5, they can be so small that they can easily pass deep in your lungs without being caught by the, the cilia, the small hairs within your lungs. And once they get deep in your lungs, they can actually be small enough in some cases to pass right into the bloodstream. So they're considered to be more dangerous, although both of them will irritate or cause breathing problems if you have asthma, especially. Another component of this smokestack coming from a coal-fired power plant is sulfur, sulfur oxides. But they can be cleaned up using smokestack scrubbers. So the idea here is you have your coal air from burning the coal coming in that has sulfur dioxide but you can get that to react with calcium oxide. And by in that reaction, you're getting calcium sulfate, which is a slurry, and it's solid, uh, or kind of like a, a slurry means sort of a mix of kind of muddy, um, solid and liquid. And you can collect that. And from there, you can do use it for maybe some other industrial process to complete the loop or dispose of it. So that means the air that's now going to the smokestack has much less sulfur in it. And we can see here, after 1970, which is when the Clean Air Act came along, the sulfur dioxide emissions reduced by about half. So that's great. And here are some things about the clean air legislation. Basically, it, it gave government money for instituting and implementing uh, pollution-reducing um, devices including the last two we just talked about. So here's a little question for you about coal. Which of these has the highest carbon content and the lowest moisture content? Is it A, anthracite, B, subbituminous, C, bituminous, D, peat, or E, ligate? And the correct answer is bituminous. Um, oops, oops. So the keyword here is second best type. The best type is anthracite. So um, anthracite basically is coal that has undergone the greatest uh, exposure to heat and pressure, which dries up moisture and which makes it burn hotter and uh, more efficiently, therefore. So all coal, however, will contain sulfur. And sulfur can lead to acid rain or acid deposition. So here's a picture of some conifer trees in North Carolina that's, that have lost a lot of their vegetation. 
or foliage, we could say. So what are we talking about when we're talking about pH? So we can see here the pH is somewhere around 4 uh, in the 4s instead of neutral, or um, which would be around 7. And actually, rainwater can pick up carbon dioxide on the way down, so it can actually be slightly acidic. Here's a little graph showing sulfur oxides and nitric oxides coming from this coal-fired electric power plant. And they mix in the air with water and oxygen to form sulfuric acid and nitric acid. So these are primary pollutants of sulfur oxides and nitrogen oxides. will then create the secondary pollutants, sulfuric acid and nitric acid. And it can eat away statues and buildings. You can see here she's losing or has lost her nose. For needles, it can, uh, it can destroy the tissue of the needles. In this case, they're less green, so they're not going to do photosynthesis as well. And it affects soil also. Um, typically, when you have soil become more acidic, it means the metals that are part of the minerals of the rocks of the soil can get um, can get released. So um, we learned about the pH of soil, and typically soil that's slightly acidic is uh, better, has more available nutrients. Um, things like um, calcium, for example. But um, when the pH gets to be too low, we can get um, excessive levels of metals, like aluminum especially. And that can then become toxic to the plant roots. And you can see these roots are not as healthy at pH of 5.2 as they are at 6.5. There's a whole list of ways that acid rain can affect um, lakes um, or soil and lakes. And um, of course, fish can die by becoming too acidic for them. So maybe it starts to irritate um, their lungs, for example, or their gills. Or maybe it destroys their eggs so that they're not able to develop into new fish. And this all, all this talk about acid rain is mostly an issue in the northeast U.S., where we tend to burn coal more commonly. So here's another term that you need to know. What is the process by which waste heat from thermoelectric power plants is used to heat offices and homes? The correct answer is cogeneration. Um, co so we talked a little bit about waste heat um, coming off of this cooling tower, but you could also take some of that waste heat and feed it into your office or homes. And so we call it cogeneration because co means at the same time we are generating both electricity and heat. And continuing on here, what is the physical law which primarily describes the inevitable loss of useful energy into waste heat? And you, you will recognize that it's the second law of thermodynamics. And this also is a factor for automobiles. If you think about all the gas going into an automobile, you're always going to have some waste heat. And, um, and that can be due to friction, partly, but also just from the heat from the explosion that's occurring inside the engine. But you can also reduce um, the energy loss um, that occurs through idling or other types of friction of the wheels and things like that, or the um, air conditioning and whatnot, with good engineering. So um, I'd like you to be aware of the CAFE standards, which stands for Corporate Average Fuel Economy. And if you notice here, the red is 2012. Other way up here, the dotted blue is 2022. And so for a given size car, with each year, we um, our manufacturers are required to increase the average miles per gallon for that size vehicle. So this is the way of our government putting pressure on car manufacturers to come up with more efficient vehicles. Okay. And thank you for tuning in. We're going to talk about mercury in our next unit on environmental health. So you have a wonderful rest of your day.